All right, welcome back. So here we are finally approaching our conclusion of our brief uh, tour through regression analysis. I don't know, maybe it doesn't feel so brief to you, but you know, not very long really. Um, so um, this time we're going to be talking about um, normal correlation analysis. Um, and you know, so what's the plot? You know, we have overall the same basic plot, which is we make observations, it's observation contains a value of some variable x and a value of some variable y, and we're looking at understanding the relationship between them, and in particular on the predictive power of x um, uh, for predicting the values for y. Um, in, the, um, in the prior uh, video on regression analysis, the idea was that the x's were not thought of as random variables, but they were kind of fixed in the nature of the experiment. You know, there were some constants and the y's were some random variables that, um, that we were then trying to predict, but the x's were, were not random. Um, in the uh, correlation analysis, we're going to um, have a much more symmetric role where both x and y are um, random variables. And um, just like, and we're also going to make some assumptions about how their distribution is described. So remember, in the regression analysis, we made the assumption that for every given value of x, the values of y followed a normal distribution with some fixed uh, mean. Um, sorry, with some fixed variance, and we were hoping that the mean bore a linear relationship to the uh, values for uh, x. In this case, we're going to assume that x and y are jointly described by a bivariate normal distribution, um, which is to say they're described really by these uh, three parameters, um, well, five parameters, I guess, sorry, the, the mean and variance of x, the mean and variance of y, and the correlation of x and y. And so, in, so now the task will be to understand this correlation, which will then give us the same information, really, the, um, the predictive power of, um, of x upon y. So just to um, fix our notation for a moment, um, just to have something to hold on to, so we're imagining we have a joint distribution, which is, um, gosh, I wonder, do I have even enough room to write this? I might have to shrink my page as we go. Um, but so the joint distribution uh, has the form, uh, so one over uh, two pi sigma one sigma two square root of one minus rho squared um, times an exponential with a whole bunch of stuff in it. Let's see. So one over uh, two one minus rho uh, one minus yeah one minus rho uh, uh, yeah one minus rho squared uh, and then what do I have I have those these three terms I have an x minus uh, mu one over sigma over sigma uh, let me call this we call these sigmas like sigma x and sigma y. Uh, x minus, oops, x minus uh, mu x over sigma x quantity squared plus um, y minus mu y over sigma y quantity squared. And then we have the, um, the correlation part and I'm running out of room. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna shrink this, shrink it like that. I'm going to zoom in over here so that I can write it neatly. Uh, so two row, um, and then I have the product of these guys, uh, mu x, um, sigma x, um, y minus mu y over sigma y. Um, great. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. We are imagining that we have a uh, bivariate normal distribution, looks something like this. This is really a distribution depending on some parameters, f of x, y, and the parameter is um, sigma x, uh, so you call it sigma x squared, sigma y squared, the variances, um, the uh, correlation row, oh, and the means, mu x, mu y, probably not gonna keep that ordering very well, but okay. So um, oh, those are the those are the parameters, and you know, and our goal um, is to um, 
is to figure these parameters out. We're going to have a special focus on, on, on rho, but all these other parameters are, of course, very much of interest. Um, and so you can, um, so in practice, what are we going to do? We're going to um, take a bunch of independent, identically distributed uh, samples of the form x i y i, and based on these samples, we're going to then try to um, try. So based on the value of the sample, which are a bunch of like little x one y one, little x two y two, up to little x and y n, depending on these numbers that we get, we then want to go back and estimate the values of these uh, five parameters, and. So how do we do that? Well, there's the usual way. We'll use um, maximum likelihood estimators. So we um, so we'll use um, we'll use these guys um, to um, to estimate to get point estimates for the values of these um, of these parameters. So the parameters being, you know, the mu x, the mu y, the sigma x squared, etc. There's these parameters um, that we had over here are these parameters. Okay, and um, how do you do that? Well, I mean, I'm not going to do it in detail, but I'll just remind you that this is really just going by, you take the likelihood function um, of these parameters. Um, so the likelihood function um, so, you know, we're given our bunches of x's and our bunches of y's, these are like vectors really. Um, well, oh, whoops, they're not vectors over there, that's just the uh, individual distribution. But when we actually take the sample, we have our, um, uh, we have a, a kind of vector of values that we're reading off. So this is just shorthand for x1, y1, x2, y2, etc. And, um, and this is the joint distribution of all those independent samples thought of as a function of my parameters. So um, what does it really look like? This is really the product from, um, you know, let's say k equals one up to n of, of, of these guys, one for each value of k. Um, you know, it's, it's f of um, x, k, y, k, and then all these sigmas and uh, and mu's and rho and all that stuff. So if I think about this whole big animal as having these x's fixed and having these parameters as variables, then I get this likelihood function, which then I can um, maximize. So we maximize this. Again, we can do it just via uh, calculus and using the usual trick of making our life easier by taking a logarithm first to simplify the, the overall form of this expression, you know, via, you know, d by d various parameters, you know, for example, rho, for example, of L, you know, or, or rather usually uh, ln of L equals zero and d by d you know, mu x of ln of l equals zero, and we just solve all these things and we get some, um, some particular values. And, uh, and what are these values? So we get um, that these um, maxima happen at, for example, um, when, when I let mu x be the sample mean, when I let mu y be the sample mean, when I let um, sigma x squared be the um, the uh, um, the usual MLA estimator that we get, which is the um, which is the method of moments estimator. So this is just the moment uh, x i minus x bar squared, um, which is also this expression, by the way, that we you know we're calling s x x. Um, sigma y squared, one over n, sum of y i minus um, y bar squared, s y y, and um, and you know similarly the um, the covariance, just like before, um, the estimator that we get is the same x s x y, uh, not squared, dot times y i minus y bar. S, X, Y, 
Um, but moreover, you know, really because of the invariance property of these MLE estimators, it, uh, it follows that we can then get a nice expression for, um, uh, for, for rho, the maximum for rho happens when I let rho be um, this SXY over the square root of S X X S X X Y Y. Uh, as 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 I've written uh, those expressions over there. And so what what does that uh, let us do? Well, you know, so these these maxima then let us translate um, to getting now functions of my samples, which then become random variables as these. Um, as these values of the random variables are replaced by the random variables themselves. And so we get, so we get estimators, you know, um, which we could call like, you know, mu x hat, mu y hat, um, sigma x um, hat squared, which is really SXX, the, the, uh, this guy that we had before sigma y squared, which is s y y. And these things, of course, are the sample means. And, um, and then we get an estimator, you know, for the, uh, for the, for the, um, for, for rho, which uh, is, is this one that I've, that I've written, s um, x y over root s x x s x y. Okay. So what does that what does that let us do? It says so we we go in there we take our measurements based on the measurements we get our point estimates um, via these formulas for what our parameters should be. Those um, point estimate those those point estimates we can think of then as giving us random variables of our sampling, and by thinking about those random variables and understanding their distribution we can then hope to make um, interval estimates um, for the actual uh, values of these unknown parameters, right? So, so for example, you know, this is just the, the standard kind of thing. Like if we want um, an interval estimate for, um, for sigma x squared, well, then, you know, after some, um, after the right normalization, we know that if I look at this divided by um, by by that, um, you know, I guess I need an n or an n minus one. Um, then this thing is going to be a um, you know some constant. This is going to be a uh, chi squared random variable with um, n minus one degrees of freedom. And so I can make interval estimates for the for, for those for those hats. I know that um, for the for this for the uh, variances, I know that um, similarly that um, because um, because the xi's are normally distributed, their um, their the sample mean is going to be a normally distributed random variable whose mean is going to be the uh, the mean for x. So this is going to be an, a nice unbiased estimator for the actual um, for the actual mean mu x. Um, I don't start out knowing the variance of that normal random variable, but but this information gives me um, the the usual kind of estimator for it, which I can then combine to get a t distribution, right? If I look at this divided by this guy with the appropriate scaling, I get a t random variable. And so using the chi-squareds and the t stuff, I'm able to get good interval estimates. I can do hypothesis testing, et cetera, on, um, on the values. Um, so, so using um, chi-squared um, and uh, t variables um, can get intervals interval estimates and can um, do hypothesis testing for the values of, um, of these um, sigma x squared, sigma y squared, um, uh, and uh, the means. Okay, so that's, that's all kind of, um, kind of familiar, right? 
So um, now let's talk about Rho, um, which is you know just a lot more interesting. So um, so this uh, this Rho hat, which is the random variable um, s x y s x x s y y root uh, root of all that stuff. Um, the um, the sample uh, values um, for this are um, you know or the sample value for this um, is generally referred to um, with the name R. So um, so really the question is you know you know this is a formula for R and what does R actually tell you about your actual correlation row? Um, now it's um, before we um, kind of go off and talk about the estimates um, that we can actually get and getting interval estimates and hypothesis testing, um, it's, uh, it's, it's useful to, to notice, so just from the fact that we're using a bivariate normal distribution, we can kind of just write things down explicitly, you can find that um, this quantity that we're interested in general in, in regression analysis, how the variance um, for, um, well, this isn't the thing we're interested in. We're interested in, in the mean, but um, but if we're if we want to ask like, what is the uh, variance of y, um, knowing x? So if you tell me x, this is really telling me kind of how much uncertainty there is in the value for y. And what we what we find this is just a general you know bivariate normal fact, is that it's going to be the variance of y, times um, one minus um, the uh, this the square of the correlation okay so um, so what is that what does that you know say I mean I'll, I'll just remind you that Rho is always you know between um, minus one and one and um, and if Rho is equal to zero in this case of the bivariate normal distribution this is really the same as saying that X and Y are independent and in that case, when rho is equal to zero, um, the the variance that you have on both sides is the same, which means that you can think of it as saying that there is just the same amount of variation or uncertainty in y having known x than there would have been if you didn't know x. On the other hand, um, if rho is equal to like plus or minus one, which is a perfect correlation either in the positive or negative direction, then though so then this whole thing would be zero and that would tell you that there is no variation in y once you know x in other words that y is completely determined by x so that is kind of the opposite situation and in general what what is what does this uh tell us well i mean if you take this and you uh kind of write this uh, a little bit differently it says that um if i solve for rho squared um you get uh, sigma y squared minus sigma uh, y given x divided by sigma y squared, or uh, I could I guess I could also it's easier to think about writing it like this, easier for me at least if I um, write it like that. And what is this kind of uh, what is this kind of saying? Well, if you think about this fraction right here. This is um, the fraction of the variance that um, that remains after x is known. So this is the amount of uncertainty that you are left with, right? Because it's the amount of variance after x is known divided by the amount of variance you had before. So this is kind of the percentage of variance that remains, uh, the fraction of variance that remains after x is known. And the complement of that, the one minus that, is the, um, the amount of the variance that was just due to x. You know, so, so this is the stuff that's left after x is accounted for, and one minus it is the stuff that is due to x. So this is the um, this row squared is the fraction of the variance which is um, 
due to the due to x due to the to the variation of x. It's kind of telling you how much of your variance is accounted for um, by x and how much is is not. Okay. Okay. So it's, this is a very natural, important thing. It's telling you the strength of the relationship between x and y. But okay. But we still have to ask. Um, you know, how do you get uh, an interval estimate and stuff like that for it? So it turns out that um, that this is a, a bit of a complicated uh, question. <laughs> so, um, so if I think about um, this this row hat as a um, as a random variable, then it turns out that um, that I can do a particular um, combination of it. And get a um, and get a t distributed random variable. So um, so if I look at um, so if I look at um, uh, row hat square root um, n minus two over one minus um, row uh, excuse me one minus uh, row hat squared. Um, it turns out that this is a, a variable with a t distribution with um, n minus two degrees of freedom. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, sorry, forgot. <laughs> okay, sorry. This isn't exactly true. It's, this is, okay. Whoops, 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 sorry. So, um, in the case, okay, no, no, no. So, so it's actually a lot more complicated, but in the case, so special case, well, that was frightening. Okay, special case, if the actual value of the correlation is zero, Okay, if you know in the outset that you have actually two independent normal random variables, then you can still look at the um, at the um, at the um, this this uh, sampling random variable, um, this row hat, and in that particular case, in that very special case, this expression is a t distributed random variable. Uh, not only that, but you can like, um, so if I call this thing T, and maybe I'll call it a capital T because it's a random variable, then you can actually, um, uh, with a little algebra, solve for, um, for, the, uh, for, your, for your row hat uh, back again. So you can solve this uh, and you'd get um, row hat is, um, is uh, T divided by uh, square root of N minus two um, plus uh, t squared. You know, in fact, you can uh, if you if you were to graph like uh, this function, it um, you know kind of. So I'm just saying like here's my kind of capital T axis and my row hat axis. It has this kind of like um, you know tangent on its side kind of look. Uh, this is a um, this is actually a monotonically um, increasing um, odd uh, function you know, one-to-one -one function. Um, and, you know, and this is how you um, point, uh, s solve it. Uh, and this is, so, but this is a very special case. This is the case where we're uncorrelated. And why would we ever even care about that? Well, in fact, this is kind of a, a crucially important case because this lets us test the hypothesis that, uh, that rho is equal to zero. Right. So at least we have, um, you know, that, you know, we're, if we have a null hypothesis that rho is equal to zero, then, you know, we could, we can now ask the kinds of questions, you know, what's the probability that, um, that my, um, you know, my rho hat is, you know, bigger than um, some value given my uh, null hypothesis given um, that the actual value of rho equals zero. And we can now try to compute that probability, right? So um, if we, um, so if we use the fact 
that these are kind of um, mutually uh, inverse um, um, functions, monotonic increasing functions. Right? The other one is just reflecting, you know, around the diagonal line kind of thing, and you know, so these are both monotonically increasing functions. Then, I mean, what do we what do we find? I'm going to apply my um, let's see which one do I apply? I'll apply this thing to both sides. Uh, and, you know, I find that this happens um, exactly, this is the same as saying that the probability of, let me squeeze this out a little bit, of, um, you know, apply the same fun monotonic uh, function to both sides. Lambda root uh, n minus 2 over 1 minus rho hat squared. Uh, whoops, lambda, no, the row hat. Uh, so that's the same probability as that. But this thing is a t distributed random variable. So this is the probability that some particular, that, that a variable with a t distribution with the n minus two degrees of freedom is at least this particular value. And, you know, and that we can compute and we can kind of do this process in reverse as well using um, using the uh, the other you know the inverse function and we can get therefore um, uh, do some hypothesis testing to check against the null hypothesis that rho is equal to zero that we're uncorrelated and that's a very natural thing to do okay so um, so what if uh, rho is not equal to zero though you know if rho is not equal to zero we should then still have some sampling distribution for for rho hat which um, you know, which depends on rho. It's going to be um, and will uh, help us test hypotheses, etc. So the story here is um, substantially, you know, more complicated, right? So you know, how would we check? You know, how would we compute something like the probability that um, that rho um, that you know rho hat is at least you know. Um, um, 0.7, assuming that we know that maybe the null hypothesis that rho is equal to 0.5 or something like that, you know, like how would we, you know, if, you know, how would we compute that kind of probability? Um, so, um, so it turns out that, that in general, you can um, write uh, an exact expression You know, write maybe in quotes, depending on whether you believe this is writing it. You'll see in a moment um, for um, for the uh, for the density function um, for um, for uh, for that describes this uh, row hat. Right, since the value of row hat uh, we usually refer to as r. I'm going to write this density as, you know, um, kind of f of r, so the, the weight of the probability at r. Um, so what is this expression? I'm sure I'm going to run out of room, but I'm going to start writing it. So it has this uh, very memorable form. It's n minus 2 times the gamma function at n minus 1 times 1 minus um, rho squared to the n minus 1 over 2. Uh, 1 minus um, r squared to the n minus 4 over 2 um, divided by um, root of uh, 2 pi gamma of n minus a half um, and then 1 minus rho r to the n minus 3 halves uh, times Um, the uh, hypergeometric function 2f1 at um, 1 half, uh, 1 half, um, 2n minus 1 over 2, and rho r plus 1 over 2. Okay, and uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, this is, so this is Gauss's hypergeometric function, kind of the, the original hypergeometric function, you know, um, and uh, it has the following expression. It's kind of like a really tweaked exponentially kind of looking thing. Um, so if in general, if 
if you want to know what is um, 2F1 of ABCX, then this is, um, uh, it has this zero to infinity, it has this kind of expression of, um, so A to the, um, to the, the rising factorial of A, uh, the kth rising factorial of A, the kth rising factorial of B over the kth rising factorial of C times um, x to the k over k factorial, that infinite sum. Uh, and if you haven't seen these rising factorials, what these things are is just, um, you know, you just take the product m, m plus 1, m plus 2, dot, 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 all the way. You have k terms in total. So we started at 0, so we're going to go up to k minus 1. Um, at least, you know, if um, if k is... Uh, is at least one, and um, and m to the rising zero is defined to be one, kind of like with factorials. So, anyways, you do, you you know, you you do that expression with these particular values plugged in, and that gives you this um, this particular expression for the density. Surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly, you can actually like work with this to some extent, and you know, and kind of um, you know, uh, in at least. Kind of in some reasonable numerical way, you know, do some do some computations this way. Okay, so um, but anyways, you know, this is perhaps uh, the the end of uh, the end of the a reasonable story in this direction, and um, and that is all for now. See you later.